Hello and welcome to this presentation on Live Long and Stay Healthy. Some words that I would hope can resonate with everyone who's watching. But for me, the most important part is the second line. Six simple lifestyle behaviors anyone can do. Because that's an empowering message. To just be able to do a few simple things, make them habits, and live long is an incredible message. Well, welcome. My name is Richard Rosenfeld. I'm a distinguished professor of otolaryngology, ear, nose, and throat at SUNY Downstate, where I've been for nearly 30 years. Uh, in addition to being department chair, I also am in charge of the residency program and um, uh, aspects of our practice plan. Uh, my degrees are in medicine, in public health, and business, but most importantly, um, recently, I was board certified by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, a relatively new group, about 15, 16 years old, that is really focusing on this incredibly important topic of healthy lifestyle. So let's begin with a word, and that word is centenarians, meaning people who live to be 100 years old. If you'd like to live to be 100, you need to sort of do what centenarians do. And uh, the goal is not to just live to 100, but to also be healthy. So you can see here the number has skyrocketed worldwide, creating a shortage of birthday candles. So plan ahead. If you're going to listen to everything in this talk and live to 100 and be healthy, start saving your birthday candles now. But more seriously, there are a couple of areas in the, the world. You see them here in California, Costa Rica, Italy, Greece, and Japan. These are called blue zones. And the reason is because in each of these areas, there are disproportionate number of centenarians. In other words, way too many people living long and healthy to be explained by chance alone. This has been studied in detail by Dan Bootner, who wrote The Blue Zones. He did this working for National Geographic, where he spent years interviewing these healthy, old people to see what are they doing differently than the rest of us. And some of the things he found out were that they eat plants. They eat healthy plant food, not exclusively, but mostly. They move around a lot, but they're not going to the gym, they're not buying treadmills, they're not lifting weights, they just have active lifestyles. Importantly, they have a sense of purpose. They know what they're doing, why they're doing it, and they feel important. And they hang around with the right people. You know, some simple things that will be themes coming up in our discussion. Here we see the blue zones again in a little different light showing you what happens. So in Loma Linda, California, where we have the Seventh-day Adventist, they're living 10 years longer on average than the life expectancy. In Costa Rica, they're seven times more likely to reach age 100. And if we go to Okinawa, Japan, the life expectancy is over 85 years in these blue zones. So there is something real going on here. Now, many of you might say, uh, you know, it's in my genes. I have bad genes. My mother, my father, my grandfather, relatives have all had heart disease and problems, and, you know, I just can't get past that. Well, let's see if that's the case. Here's a, a study that looked at your risk, genetic risk, and coronary artery disease, heart disease, and what they found out basically is, yes, if you have a family history, a genetic predisposition, you do have more heart disease. However, However, if you adopt a favorable lifestyle, meaning at least three of these healthy factors being you don't smoke, you're not obese, you get some activity, and you eat relatively healthy, if you do three or four of those things, you lower your risk by almost 50% despite your genetics. So you can modify it. The bottom line, as shown in this book, your DNA is not your destiny. It's not your genes. It's how you behave, it's how you act, it's your lifestyle. Looking at what determines the health of Americans, we see here behavioral patterns tend to be about 40% of the contributors to mortality. Uh, here we see deaths in the U.S. Uh, going back a, a few years, but 
way disproportionate behaviors are the major drivers, okay? Obesity, inactivity, smoking are the real problems. Looking at it in another way, here's a, a study that looked at four different ways to assess the impacts of, of behavior and other things on longevity. And what we see is behavioral patterns are the key. 40 to 65 percent of your longevity is related to behavior. Now I'm a physician and I like to think that that what I do makes a difference in my patients lives. However, medical care is a depressing minority of your health. It's 7, 10 percent at best and this comes up in study after study after study. So if you're relying on the medical system to make you live long and stay healthy, that's not the case. It's your behavior what you do. So, having hopefully made the case now that a healthy lifestyle is something worth pursuing, what, it, what am I referring to? What are we talking about here? Very simple. And the authority on this is the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So, six things, and we can summarize it in a few words. Eat plants. No, I'm not suggesting you become a giraffe and graze at trees. We'll talk more about that. Keep moving. Don't smoke stay calm, stay well, and have positive social connections. Like people, love people, six simple things. The American College of Lifestyle Medicine defines this, this approach with these six pillars as an evidence-based lifestyle therapeutic approach. This is not just something to prevent disease, but even if you already have type 2 diabetes, hypertension, you're obese, your cholesterol is out of whack, um, you're prone to heart disease or stroke or other problems, this can treat and reverse conditions too if you follow these tenets. So it's very powerful and what's most powerful at all of all is it's empowering. You can do it. It's up to you. Even modest changes help. Here we look again at lifestyle medicine, and it's not just somebody's opinion. This is evidence informed. There is a huge volume of evidence that supports all of these things as being good for your health. So it's not opinion, it's evidence based. The first pillar of live long and stay healthy is to eat plants, to eat healthy plant food. So, wh so what do I mean by that? You know, the standard American diet is pretty bad. It's about 60-70% ultra-processed, highly refined foods that give you diabetes and obesity. The portions are out of control. It's food that, that is not good for you. So when we say eat plant-based, it means move in the direction of more whole plant foods. Fruits, vegetables, beans, legumes. Um, edamame, lentils, all types of beans, whole grains, whole wheat pasta instead of regular pasta, brown rice instead of white rice, you know, nuts and seeds, water, avoid the snack foods, the garbage, the sugar, the white flour, etc. That's what we're referring to. At SUNY Downstate Health Science University, where I've been for almost 30 years, um, our, our group has taken this to the level of an official position statement that the medical executive committee has signed off on that reads plant-based nutrition emphasizing this consumption of vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, and fruits can prevent, treat, or reverse certain chronic diseases in adults. I mean, that is empowering to get medical professionals to sign off on this. And the main things that we're referring to, the chronic lifestyle diseases, include being overweight, obese, a high body mass index, meaning your weight is too much for your height, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, a real problem. In Brooklyn, we have what's called diabesity, almost an epidemic of diabetes, diabetes and obesity combined. Coronary artery disease, out of control cholesterol lipids. Uh, these are the conditions. Now we also have, and I'd encourage you to view this at your leisure, a website. We have a committee on plant-based health and nutrition that has incredible resources 
uh, that you can find. You can see this at www.downstate.edu slash plant-based. So it's there. I encourage you to explore the site. Lots of videos, webinars, evidence profiles, uh, uh, guides to eating healthy. There's really a lot out there. Our position statement also goes on to talk about how the real benefit of this plant-based diet is not so much that you're exclusively just eating plants, but you're increasing the amount of plant foods in your diet relative to the animal products. So you can still eat some fish and chicken and beef and other things, but it's not so much getting just simply removing those, it's really putting in more of these healthy whole plant foods. Uh, there's not a lot of evidence to say that one diet's better than the other. Speak more about that in a moment. Um, and the research is still evolving. I call your attention to this guide, Eating for Health and Longevity. It's on the website I just mentioned at the lower left of your slide here, downstate.edu slash plant-based. This is a wonderful guide, very professionally produced with lots of great pragmatic information on moving in this plant-forward direction. And that word plant forward, plant focused comes up, or plant predominant, you can call it what you'd like. It means diets that are primarily healthy plant foods. They tend to have a lot of carbohydrates, probably about 70 percent. So this is the exact opposite of those so-called keto diets or paleo diets you may hear about that tend to have a lot of fat. So here we're talking about these in, in particular. The DASH is a specific diet that was developed for hypertension trials, and it's been shown to reduce hypertension. It's got a lot of carbs, a fair amount of fat. There are some allowances for fish and chicken and meat, just like Mediterranean is very popular. That tends to be more in the direction of fish, maybe a little chicken, limited meat, but it allows a fair amount of olive oil, you know, dairy, uh, cheese products. A vegan, on the other hand, is exclusively plant-based. So you're not eating any beef, chicken, fish, eggs. Vegans don't even eat honey because it's made from bees. But a vegan, however, can be a very unhealthy diet because you could eat Oreo cookies, milkshake, not milkshakes, but uh, soda, candy, bread, uh, white pasta, you know, pasta, regular pasta, white bread, and call yourself a vegan. It's not very healthy. It, the diet that I followed for many years and that most people would consider the optimal choice for plant-based is the whole food plant-based diets, which by definition ends up being low fat because you're really not including any processed oils, even olive oils. And this tends to be about 70% carbohydrates and maybe the rest split between proteins and fats. And it's a question about eating for your long-term health and longevity and reversing disease as opposed to some of these fad diets, keto diets, paleo diets, uh, other things where you can lose some weight, but they're not intended for long-term use to keep you healthy. So plant-forward diets, whole food, plant-based. Carbohydrates have a bad rep sometimes, and certainly with the keto and paleo diets, you'll hear Oh, you got to limit those carbs. They're no good for you. Well, that is a bunch of nonsense. What's not good for you are highly processed, refined carbs. What is very good for you are whole carbs because they're loaded with fiber. And in this study, we see, it's a review of many different other studies, uh, eating lots of fiber really reduces substantially your likelihood of dying from heart disease, cardiovascular, stroke, type 2 diabetes, colorectal cancer is influenced by diet. Um, and it's not just diet, but it's also whole grains. So carbohydrates, whole grains are where the fiber comes from generally. Um, but it's again, it's those legumes, um, the lentils, the chickpeas, the various beans, edamame, soy products, and those unprocessed carbohydrates. So whole grains such as whole wheat flour or uh, buckwheat, uh, many others, spelt flour. These are all whole grain flours, whole oats, things that are healthy, loaded with fiber, 
keep you healthy. And don't worry about protein. If you eat a healthy, whole food, plant-based diet, you're going to get your protein. Lentils, edamame, beans are loaded with protein. Even lowly baked potatoes and spinach have protein. And in contrast to animal protein, plant-based protein has fiber and all sorts of nutrients. It does not have cholesterol and saturated fat. So lots of benefits to plant-based protein. So I spent a little more time on this first pillar, uh, the diet, the plant forward, because it's very important. Let's move now to keep moving. This is the second behavior. The U.S. has released physical activity guidelines for Americans uh, two, three years ago. This is the second edition, and it basically says you should keep moving. And it's not that difficult. 150 to 300 minutes a week, which would be 20, 30, 40 minutes a day of moderate intensity activity, such as walking, brisk walking, yard work, gardening, swimming a little bit. You don't have to go crazy. Or if you're doing running and vigorous activity, only 75 to 150 minutes a week. If you do more, it helps, but just doing that modest amount is great for your health. And if you can, you add in on two days a little strength activities such as weightlifting or body weight activities to build the muscles and the bones. Now here's the thing, in the updated guidelines in 2018, they focused for the first time on brain health. Activity, physical activity, reduces your risk of degenerative neurologic diseases, in particular dementia, Alzheimer. It keeps you sharp. So eating right and staying a little active is the best way to stay sharp, really empowering. Uh, some recent efforts have looked at what's called the MIND diet, which is really a mix of the Mediterranean diet and that diet for hypertension kind of has, you know, the whole grains and stuff, a little bit of, of chicken and fish, uh, minimal animal products, uh, lots of beans and legumes at least every other day. They do allow some cheese. Um, so it's not whole food plant-based, but it's close to it. It's a healthy diet for the most part. And just following this diet, they've shown a 35% lower likelihood of getting Alzheimer's disease just by eating healthy. You know, Alzheimer's disease is a miserable thing, and we're seeing almost an epidemic of it in terms of growth in the U.S. now, and it's uh, likely in part because of, of diet as well as physical activity. The reason the government recommends this, this window of 150 to 300 minutes a week of moderate activity is because that's where you get the bang for the buck. That's where the curve comes down to the point that you really see uh, not a huge difference after that, and if you take it out to crazy numbers, more than 1,800 hours a week, you start having negative effects. You may have heard that sitting is the new smoking, and in a way it is. Um, do not sit all day. If you sit all day, get up and move around, go up and down a flight of stairs, shake your legs, get a standing desk, do something, but if you sit all day, it's truly becoming the new smoking in terms of risk to your body, to your life. Don't smoke is the next one, and fortunately in the U.S. there's been a dramatic decline in smoking. And even after quitting for 20 minutes, you do better. Uh, of course, if you can stick it out for 10 or 15 years, you're really going to get benefits. But if you are a smoker, do your best to stop smoking. I'm not going to belabor this point, uh, but it goes beyond smoking. Uh, the cigarette users have lots of problems, 13% life lost in one study. The average age of death is 68.7. You may have recalled in Okinawa, Japan, it's in the 80s, 85.3 years because they don't smoke. They do other things too. Um, almost as bad is use of alcohol or chronic use abuse of alcohol, so-called uh, you know, alcohol abuse uh, syndrome. Um, which is not good. I mean, that's also going to lead to a lot of life lost. It's going to reduce your life expectancy, give you chronic diseases. Nothing wrong with an occasional glass of red wine. And in the blue zones, they actually advocate for a glass of red wine daily. Uh, but having two, three, four drinks a day is not good. Next thing. Um, so you're, you're eating plant forward. You're getting a reasonable exercise. You're avoiding the risky substances, smoking, alcohol, et cetera. 
Now stay calm and be positive. You know, you have to have that positive mental attitude. If you have a positive affect, it's actually been shown in many studies to help you live longer and reduce your mortality. Here we see a review of many, many studies. Your mortality went down. Your risk of dying goes down by 25% just by having a positive attitude. Uh, how much does that cost to have that attitude? Uh, your mortality uh, was reduced even more with a highly positive attitude, even after you adjust for medical, psychological, social factors. So thinking positive is more than just a good idea. It helps you live long. New York Times recently had a, a piece about mindfulness, which is related to this positive attitude. And people hear mindfulness, they say, you know, that's meditation. I'm a busy person. I can't sit down and meditate. There was a study years ago that showed if you took type A people who are productive and ask them to meditate, they actually get more stressed because they find the meditation so stressful. But there's two types of meditation and mindfulness. You know, mindfulness is really just this concept of active engagement. It's being in the present. And you get a positive attitude by focusing on the present. If you obsess with the past and you think about the future all the time, you just can't function. So this Western view of active mindfulness, engaging in the present, is what I'm referring to. And there's a definition of positive mental attitude. It goes, it's being content with the past, you know, happy in the present, and hopeful for the future. So that's what I would encourage. You know, it also means having a certain mindset, and this book by Carol Dweck talks about it. It's this growth mindset, meaning there are no limits to what you can do, okay? If you put your mind to it, you can achieve things. You're not fixed. You're not limited by any thoughts about your, your uh, learning capacity or your IQ. It's having this positive attitude that you can do things, that you can acquire intellect, skills, talents through practice, perseverance. Number five, sleep a bit. You know, get some sleep at night. And shown here is the hours of sleep versus various bad outcomes such as dying, getting heart disease, strokes. And what we see is if your sleep is too short or too long, you have a problem. The sweet spot is about seven hours a night for adults. So somewhere between that six and eight, you get, start getting below six is not good. You get above eight, it actually rises. Too much sleep is not good. And to get the best sleep, there are some things, sleep hygiene, you know, don't take excessive naps. Some of the things I like to emphasize are, you know, getting a little exercise, walking an hour or two before bedtime, uh, having the right temperature. It should be a little cool in the room. If it's very warm, it, it interferes with sleep. Uh, be consistent. Don't have wildly differing times where you go to sleep and get up on different days or weekends and weekdays. And, um, uh, you know, don't dwell on insomnia. If you can't fall asleep, just stay in bed. Or, you know, especially in terms of restfulness, I do a lot of exercise, running, jogging, weightlifting, etc. And even just laying in bed if I'm awake is going to provide a certain degree of recovery for the body, for the muscles. Interestingly, uh, sleep is also associated with dementia. And getting less than six hours increases your risk by almost 40%. Similar curves that I just showed you here, looking at that sweet spot again of seven hours where you reduce the risk. You have the lowest risk of dementia if you're getting that seven hours of sleep. So if you like to get dementia and Alzheimer's, just sleep very little or sleep too much. Pretty straightforward. Last behavior, love people. Social connections, very important. Uh, and not everybody is socially connected. There are quite a few adults who feel lonely or isolated. It's not uncommon, but that connectedness is important. It's important in the blue zones. It's important in life, and it correlates with mortality. Again, looking at 35 studies, almost 80,000 people, if you're lonely on a regular basis, your mortality goes up by 44%. For men and 26% by women. Apparently, women are a little more tolerant of loneliness, but, um, and it's independent of depression, so it's a real thing. 
have those social connections, hang out with positive, like-minded people. If we look at this in terms of the core dimensions, you see positive relationships as part of the circle. And having those positive relationships um, really reduces your disease risk and, and promotes longevity. Most importantly, it builds resilience. And you cannot have enough resilience when things like COVID or other challenges come around. So to tie this together, a few slides on, you know, how do I begin this journey? How do I get into these behaviors that was talked? Well, the first is to recognize you have the power to change. It's not your doctor. It, it, it's you. You can do it. And uh, the moment you accept responsibility and say, I want to change, you can do it. I accepted responsibility in my life about six years, six years ago. Um, yeah, probably it was about 2015, where I said enough is enough, and I made major changes in my life that have helped me incredibly. If you even think about this as a prescription for longevity, it's been said just find your purpose. That goes back to the blue zones. Have those positive connections, social engagement, be around people, be positive. And then the healthy lifestyle, of course, the plant forward diet, the right exercise, sleep, stress reduction, et cetera. Those are the ingredients. Uh, and it's not always or never, okay? I'm not telling you to drop every dairy product and meat product immediately or start exercising like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's a matter of most of the time, of making changes, of moving in the right direction, okay? Most of the time beats never and is the path to all of the time. A uh, recent consensus report came out from National Academy of Sciences, and it basically said, you know, we're in trouble in the U.S. Life expectancy is actually falling for the first time in 100 years. It's going down. Um, the U.S. is 26th of 35 countries in longevity. I mean, that's awful. And it's because of obesity, diabetes, lifestyle. It, it's not because of our medical or healthcare system. That, that, that's good. And mortality among working age adults um, was going down dramatically and now it's going up because of all this cardiovascular disease from bad habits. So to sum up, the six pillars I want you to focus on are eat plants or be plant forward. Keep moving, don't smoke, avoid the risky substances, manage your stress, stay calm and positive, sleep seven hours ideally, six to eight, and maintain those healthy relationships. And remember, as shown here, sometimes the smallest step in the right direction is the biggest step of your life. There's a saying that gentle persistence will always beat the labors of a spasmodic Hercules. You should not be a spasmodic Hercules with this. It's gentle persistence, step by step, in the right direction, and that will hopefully allow you to live long and stay healthy with these six simple lifestyle behaviors. So I appreciate your attention. I hope this has been engaging and enlightening and wish you all the best on your journey to healthy longevity. Thank you.